Welcome to Out of the Box Radio with me, your host, Christine Blasdale. Out of the Box Radio is a weekly podcast of audible ear candy dedicated to bringing a fresh perspective on this thing that we call life. And each and every week, we're going to be diving into the topics that matter most with lively conversations on issues such as health, wellness, and transformational healing, all with the goal of creating a better world and becoming a happier human being. I will be your tour guide for this epic adventure, and each and every week we're going to be embarking on a journey with the ultimate goal being transformation to our highest potential. And now, let's get out of the box. One of the reasons why I started Out of the Box Radio was to help people who suffer from different, uh, well, from different things in their life, from from past experiences and current situations. And today's show is no exception. Um, My guest today is Rabbi Stephen Leder. He is the senior rabbi of Wilshire Boulevard Temple in Los Angeles and the author of such critically acclaimed books as The Extraordinary Nature of Ordinary Things and More Money Than God, Living a Rich Life Without Losing Your Soul. We're going to talk about that. (laughs) He's also the recipient of the American Jewish Press Association's Lewis Rappaport Award for Excellence in Commentary and the Religious Action Center's Kovler Award. And he is a fellow in the British American Project, which is a think tank bringing together leaders from America and Great Britain. Newsweek magazine has named him one of the top 10 most influential rabbis in America. And his latest book, More Beautiful Than Before, How Suffering Transforms Us, is uh, is the topic of conversation today. He's the leader, again, of the Wilshire Boulevard Temple, one of America's largest and most important congregations, and it's located in the heart of Los Angeles. And I want to welcome to Out of the Box Radio, Rabbi Steve Leader. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, the you know the title of your new book, More Beautiful Than Before, How Suffering Transforms Us, really, uh, really hit me hard because... I I don't know. I think I look around and I see so many beautiful things happening with people and maybe it's because they are transforming from former pain. But I wanted to know what was the impetus? What gave you the motivation to write this new book more beautiful than before? The book uh, is a result of my having spent so I've been a rabbi uh, at Wilshire Boulevard Temple in Los Angeles for 30 years. The book is a result of my having spent 27 of those 30 years counseling thousands of people through very difficult and painful situations. And then I was in a very uh, frightening car accident, which ultimately resulted in a very serious lower back problem and surgery, opioids, depression, and eventual but very slow recovery. And I realized going through that process of my own pain, which was was frightening and depressing, that despite my you know, best intentions for the previous 27 years, I actually didn't know very much about pain until I experienced it myself. And I learned a great deal about pain. And I think it's, I know it's made me not only a, a better rabbi, but a better human being as a result. And so I, I felt that this, th- my story and so many other stories I know about the transformative power of pain. Pain is a very powerful teacher. Uh, I felt that these stories should be told uh, because, you know, to be honest, one person can only personally help so many people. But a book has the opportunity to to help, you know, many, many thousands of people, maybe even millions of people someday, who knows. So that was that was the mission was to to help people who are suffering and frankly that means all of us at one point or another in our lives to help us all realize that the end result of that suffering can be as I say in the book a, a kinder, gentler, wiser, more beautiful life. Well, especially since there are you know there are several ways to react to pain and and it depends on the pain you suffered um from an accident 
a particular type of physical pain, which also brings emotional pain as well and, Correct. and worry Correct. and concern. Um, but then there is, you know, there are those who suffer pain, emotional trauma, uh, perhaps at an early age, physical trauma, sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've this has been a topic of conversation with with people on guests that have been on this program that some people who suffer from pain from the hands of others um, will go one of two ways or maybe somewhere in the middle. But a lot of it is either they experience pain from someone else and they vow to themselves because they've experienced that, that they will never do that to another human being. And it almost uh, it gives them a, it's not a superhuman power, but it, it's a power of empathy and sympathy yes. for others. And then there are those that when it is trauma at such a young age, will take it out on others. And as they say, hurt people hurt people, right? Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to find out in the, in the process of writing this book, uh, the, the, the people that you came in contact, were the majority, were they taking that first step as far as once they've experienced that pain, especially at the hands of others, that they have uh, decided never to do that to others? Or, or has it been sort of a mixed bag that you've experienced? Well, I think the trauma of any sort has the residual PTSD that comes from it. I think, uh, now, so in other words, even though a person who has suffered this kind of trauma might avoid traumatizing someone else, uh, and, and yes, that is, that is sometimes the case, they're still internally traumatized, of course. And so they have their own internal suffering. And, and one way or another, if that's not addressed, it leads to, to an unbalanced life. It leads to embitterment. It leads to depression. Um, it, it leads to a sense of isolation and abandonment. Um, so, you know, I, do, I will say this uh, on the other side of that coin. There's a, a phrase in the book that I quote, which says, every person is wounded. Mm. And, remembering, and remembering a person's wounds makes it easier to forgive. Whenever I see someone behaving terribly, I always try to stop and ask myself, what has happened to this person to yeah. turn him or her into, you know, such an embittered, angry, petty, you know, or dysfunctional human being? And would I frankly be any different if that had happened to me? You know, one of the things that thinking about pain and recognizing the pain of others and recognizing our own pain can do for us is vastly, vastly increase our, our, you know, empathy and our ability uh, to be sensitive to others who are suffering. And, you know, there's another part of the book that I think is very important to call attention to because it's more rare. There are other books, of course, <clears throat> about pain, about for people who experience pain. I certainly didn't create a genre. On the other hand, there's a whole section of this book that deals with the issue of what about when you are not the victim of pain, but the cause of pain? What about when you are the betrayer, not the betrayed? What do you do when you have deeply wounded another person? Because that's its own kind of pain. Yes. And, and requires its own kind of process and remedy. You know, we all eventually say and do things that we are not proud of. What do you do with shame and guilt? How do you make things right? What does real apology look like, sound like, feel like? And, and are you a humble enough person to engage in that process? So that, that's a very critical part of pain that most people, frankly, don't have much to, to talk about. Well, we have, there's, I mean, how many best-selling books are there on on surviving pain and dealing right. with pain and overcoming pain? And yes. there is nothing. There really, I, I, I don't, I can't recall anything um, uh, uh, talking about the person and having empathy for the person who's caused the pain because That's we are right. such a judgmental society as well that it's like, well, you're bad and bad people should suffer. <laughs> right, they deserve their suffering. We don't think of them as wounded. We don't think of them as having had 
abusive or terrible or cruel parents. Uh, we don't think of them as having some kind of horrible anxiety disorder. Uh, we don't understand the narcissist very well uh, and the insecurity that that disguises. So, and, and we also don't really know what to do sometimes. So I, I in, a book, uh, in the book, there's an essay called Hurt and Run. And in this essay, I talk about how do you make things right when you've hurt someone and left them and their hurt feelings aside like roadkill? What do you do? And there's a, a very famous rabbi and thinker of, of the Middle Ages named Moses Maimonides who died over 800 years ago. And he actually laid out a four-step process that a person can go through in order to be forgiven and in order for reconciliation to take place. There are steps you can take. And by the way, one of them involves the ability, willingness, courage, humility, to say the three words that I believe are the three most difficult words for human beings to say. And by the way, it's not, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry can mean a lot of things, Christine. It can mean, yeah. I'm sorry I got caught. It yeah. can mean, I'm sorry this. <laughs> right. I'm sorry this, right? I'm, I'm sorry, sorry it hurt you. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm sorry you feel like I, you know, fill in the blank. So I'm sorry, frankly, doesn't, doesn't cut it. The three most difficult words for most human beings to say are, I was wrong. Oh, boom. I was wrong. I was wrong is a much higher degree of culpability and responsibility uh, and and remorse and confession than I'm sorry. And saying I was wrong in most cases immediately takes the sting out. And it starts to create a path for healing and reconciliation and redemption. And, and this, of course, is so important. Uh, and and, and it's hard for people to say it, but I'll tell you something. You know, hear me, husbands and wives and partners and brothers and sisters and parents and children and business partners. I was wrong is the most powerful thing you can say when you have caused pain to another person. And it seems to be, and perhaps it's the ego uh, that rears its ugly head, but yeah, not it, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say that that the the ego seems to have this stranglehold on us where it refuses to admit being wrong. Um, That's right. Uh, That's right. I, I, sometimes, now, listen, yeah. There's it, a reason. There's a reason for that. Why? It's not just e it's not just ego. Many of us were raised in homes where saying I was wrong was punished. Well, we were punished very harshly for saying I was wrong. We weren't uh, supported in that depth of honesty. And we live in a culture that uh, punishes people for saying I was wrong. You know, um, any doctor who makes a mistake, who would like to say to the patient, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I made a mistake, is immediately told by his or her attorneys, don't admit guilt. Don't say a word. It's all actionable. So one of the things I talk about in the book is this concept of a no-fault apology law. So there, there are over 30 states now in the country that have something called a no-fault apology law, which means that physicians can apologize for mistakes without it being admissible in court. And guess what's happened in all these states? Mm -hmm. The number of medical malpractice suits has plummeted because people don't want to sue their doctors. They just want the doctor to accept responsibility for the mistake. And once that happens, frankly, that's enough for people. Mm. Well, you know, one thing that you talk about is the perception of pain. And I love what you say. What you, say. you say pain is not a matter of intellect. It is a matter of the spirit and a matter of the soul. That is yes. very deep, and I don't know if many people can uh, grasp that, but I have a feeling you'll be able to kind of bring us to that. Yes, yeah, so this, this is what I mean when I say that pain is not a matter of the intellect. Um, so Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian philosopher, said, I don't know who discovered water, but it wasn't the fish. Mm -hmm. Now, now what, did, what did he mean by that? 
Why doesn't a fish know it's in water? Because a fish generally is born into, lives, and dies in water. And therefore, the fish actually has no perspective on, on its own life. And, and we are no different, right? Until, until pain jerks us out of our reality. When does a fish discover water? When it's caught, right? When it's gasping for air and flailing at the end of a hook. That's when a fish discovers water. When do you discover good health? When you lose your health. Yes. When, when do you discover the true depths of your love for someone? When you lose them, right? So that is not an intellectual process. You have to be jerked out of that complacency, out of our daily thought patterns. You have to be jerked out of it by pain in order to frankly have any real perspective on your own life. I wish there was another way, Christine, but I haven't found one. You know, success doesn't change people very much. It just encourages people to keep doing more of the same. Being comfortable in life doesn't really create much sensitivity for, for those who suffer. It's pain that teaches us how to be uh, a more compassionate, thoughtful, grateful human being. And by the way, let's be clear about this book, More Beautiful Than Before. It is not an idealization of pain. It is not a glorification of pain. I wish no one had to suffer pain. And, and people who suffer extreme pain, it is not worth the lessons it comes to teach. But neither is it worthless. Mm. You know, uh, I have a, a, had a friend who died of cancer. He had three different forms of cancer, one after the next. And when I went to visit him in the hospital, when he was dying of that third and final cancer, he looked up at me from his hospital bed and he said, you know, Steve, this much character I don't need. Wow. So, right. Wow. So I, <laughs> yeah. I'm not pretending that suffering is something beautiful and not really suffering. No, it's horrible. It's painful. It's frightening. It's depressing. It's excruciating. It's lonely and it's dark. However, when one comes through the other end of it, if if you have it, it, it affects your spirit and your soul in a way that frankly does make you a more beautiful person in the deepest meaning of that word. You know, in a, in a paradoxical sort of way, we are in a way far more whole after we've been broken in some way. I'll give you another way to look at it. In the Bible, God says, I put my words upon your heart. God puts God's words upon our heart. So the sages ask, why upon our heart and not in our hearts? You know, it, certainly God is capable of placing God's words into our hearts. Why, why only upon our hearts? And the answer the sages give is that it isn't until our heart is broken that the words can enter. Mm. So in this very powerful way, we become more whole as a result of our brokenness. And so much of that is in how we look at that pain. We, what, I've, what I'm observing is that we are um, a lot of people walking around with a lot of pain. Everyone, everyone, Christine, right? that person sitting next to you right now, that person on the bus, that person across the aisle from you or at the table across from you, everyone suffers to be human is to suffer and to to hmm, what i have noticed in through my 53 years on this planet is that the moments and and i and because i understand what you said hit me so hard the moments where i experienced the greatest pain physical or emotional you know heart-centered pain are the moments where i grew exponentially from, yes. for coming coming out of that and also it it when you're in that pain it's sometimes it's it's a little bit it's a little bit difficult to see the growth and the yes. you know what where you're where you're really headed but i remember one time i had a, a as regards to physical pain i had one of the most excruciating uh things happen i had my neck broken oh, my and goodness. i had a, a broken neck so I had one of the discs were broken, and then another one was um, basically uh, pinched. It was pinching the nerve. 
So, so painful. Oh. Extremely painful, right? Like off yeah. the charts. I could I not, it. couldn't lift, couldn't lift my arms, and mm-hmm. m- the weight of my head felt. I, I just wanted it off. And mm-hmm. I remember laying there in in my bed, and you know, first comes the the inside chatter of why is this happening to me? Oh, poor me, right? Mm-hmm. This of is course. this sucks yeah. because it really is. It's extremely painful. And then something came over me, and I and I don't know if it's the ability to look at the brighter side of things, but <laughs> I said, you know, what was I doing in life? that I needed to stop. Because when you're in that kind of pain, all of a sudden you realize what's really important. It's almost like when you have a near-death experience and you realize all of a sudden the fact that you can breathe, the fact that you have a bed, the fact, (laughs) right? You become very grateful. Yes, you know, Christine, there's (laughs) there's an essay in the book, um, you know, that talks about this this very uh, idea uh, pain, you know, creating a deeper sense of gratitude. And there's, uh, it's called examine your life. The, uh, the ancient Talmud says, if you are visited by pain, examine your life. The only thing that really motivates most people to change is pain. Now, um, you know, Dostoevsky said that his greatest fear was that his life would not be worthy of his suffering. Such a powerful line. Mm. In other words, the challenge, which you have met, obviously, is to make your life worthy of your suffering, right? You let let your suffering strip away that which does not matter and strip away those people who don't matter and, and let it reveal instead the core and essence of what you want your life to be about. Um, this is the positive side of pain. It, it, it stops us from wasting our precious emotional and psychic and spiritual energy on things that ultimately do not matter. Mm. And one thing that you say in the in the book, and this is relating to what I was talking about, is something called uh, taking a blessing inventory. Yeah. Can you talk about yes. that? Sure. So, you know, I it, look. The first step. The book's divided into three sections: surviving, healing, and growing. How do we survive pain? Well, part of the way you survive pain is by putting it in a context with which you are already familiar. So there are two things to this. One, ask yourself, okay, what prior to this was the most painful thing you ever went through and how did you get through it? And then remind yourself and have faith in those same internal resources, whatever they are. I reached out for help or I let time work its magic or I got professional help, whatever it is. Uh, or I became more prayerful, or I spent more time in nature, whatever it is that enabled you to get through your previous suffering is still there for you as, as a tool and as a resource, and and you will you, you have, should have faith in your ability to rely on those same things again. All right, that's number one. The second thing is to realize, through what I call a blessing inventory, that most of the wonderful things in your life are rooted in something painful. Look, even childbirth itself, right? The most wonderful thing in your life is your life. Childbirth is the most painful is, thing. Is a, is a miraculous, beautiful blessing rooted in a terribly painful beginning. Right. So many of our blessings are rooted in painful beginnings. Right. Ask people who fell in love with each other. Well, it happened after I'd had this horrible breakup. You know. Ask people who have lost a lot of weight or take better care of their bodies in some other way, why they're doing it. Well, because I had a scare, because the doctor told me I was diabetic, because I had a heart attack, because I found out I'm, a, I'm at risk for a stroke, because my father died at 50, whatever it is. These horribly tragic things begin as one thing, but often blossom into some form of blessing. And having faith in that can help you survive this, this first terrible you know, stage of pain. I, I, it, that is a constant, uh, and that's something that we, we need to be on top of, isn't it? Because we, it's, it's easy for us to, it is easy for us to, to be a victim, uh, yes. and to wallow in that pain. 
And by the way, mm-hmm. I think that's fine for a while. You know, grief yeah. is like that. Yeah. Anybody who thinks that grief, you know, well, let me put it this way. Uh, if you think the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, you don't understand grief. <laughs> right, right, right. It ebbs and flows and ebbs and flows. And sometimes, like, a, like waves, you know, when you're, when you're hit by a wave that just crashes down upon you, the best thing is not to try to stand up in it. The best thing is to, to just give over to it and, and float with it, right? And pain and grief can be like that. Sometimes you just have to float with it until you're able to stand up again. Mm. I've been reminded right now, too, and um, I'm what is coming to me right now is the idea of being like you said being present with the pain because so many of us too when we're in pain we want to escape it we escape it through if it's emotional pain we sometimes people escape it through alcohol through drugs yes yeah uh if it's a physical pain we might escape it through obviously for pharmaceuticals and things like that but and we might have to by the way for a while right but the we, the escaping of the pain, if it's an emotional pain, um, uh, even though it, it if it is temporary, there is a great healing that happens when you are present with that pain. Uh, it's true. And look, uh, let's distinguish between physical and emotional pain. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to emotional pain, addiction is an anesthesia. Whatever the addiction is, sex, drugs, gambling alcohol, work, shopping, you name it. It's, it's <laughs> generally about numbing the pain. And that numbing process leads to, guess what? More pain. Right? The very thing you are doing to address the pain and anxiety creates nothing but more pain and more, na- more anxiety, and you're chasing your tail. And that's, that's the horror of addiction. And you're right. It isn't until you face that pain in a different way that you begin to heal and and to grow. Now, physical pain. Physical pain sometimes really can't be dealt with in any other way than than opioids. Um, and you know, I think that's part of the opioid conversation that people aren't being honest about. Sometimes. It is the best or only tool available to a physician. Sometimes I know when I was at my worst, it was the only thing that would move my pain from a nine or a ten. Really, you know, I remember being in so much pain that I tried, you know, not to even blink. It hurt so much. Mm. Mm. Any movement, any movement was knife-like in my in my body. So the only thing that brought that pain from a ten to a you know seven or an eight. The only thing that worked were opioids. And they didn't make me high. They just made it possible for me to turn onto my side without screaming. So sometimes, let's be honest, these are the only things that work. The problem is, of course, that they become terribly uh, seductive. And, you know, you want more and more and more because it it hurts so much. So I, I think we have to distinguish between how people address their physical pain and how they address their emotional pain. Nevertheless, people in physical pain still, the more they catastrophize the future, the more hopeless their thinking patterns are, the more pain they feel. So you, you have to work very hard to change the internal dialogue You know, from I can't do what I love anymore to, for example, this is going to cause me to do new things that I never would have otherwise done. You know, from in my case, for example, I used to love to play racquetball and I loved spinning and I couldn't do either during my back situation and I still can't. Uh, but now I have a beautiful garden in the backyard and an elevated bed garden because I can't bend over very well. Um, but the, the joy of gardening was completely absent in my life when I was doing these more aggressive forms of exercise. My my favorite example, which I do talk about in the book, because it's a piece about how healing being in nature can be. There's nothing to give you perspective like nature. 
So uh, I used to, uh, in Southern California, there's a, an amazing national park called Joshua Tree National Park. It's the size of the state of Rhode Island. It's one of my favorite places on earth. And it has these massive, massive boulders. And I used to boulder in Joshua Tree, which means, you know, essentially scampering up these, these huge tall boulders to get to the top. And it was a very aggressive kind of thing and frankly a little dangerous. After my surgery and, and, and ever since, bouldering is out of the question. Now I go to Joshua Tree, I find a very modest mound, walk up and sit on the top of it. And what I discovered in doing that is that it enabled the desert to come to me rather than me imposing myself on the desert. Mm. I, I, I heard things I'd never heard before. I felt the breeze in a way I'd never felt it before. I saw the colors and the light in ways I'd never seen them before. And, and I prayed differently. The prayer came to me. I didn't have to chase after God in, in such an aggressive way. Uh, so, you know, the, the absence created a presence. Well, yeah, yeah, that um, that hit home. <laughs> that's that's yeah. absolutely beautiful, folks. If you're just uh, tuning in, my name is Christine Blasdale. This is Out of the Box Radio, and my guest this hour is Rabbi Stephen Leader, and he's the senior rabbi of the Wilshire Boulevard Temple in Los Angeles, and author of many critically acclaimed books. Uh, such as The Extraordinary Nature of Ordinary Things and More Money Than God, Living a Rich Life Without Losing Your Soul. And we're talking about his latest book, More Beautiful Than Before, How Suffering Transforms Us. And um, Rabbi, one th one thing that, um, and it ties into how you how your perception has changed and since you had to adapt, um, I, I'm wondering if you can talk about this because you've experienced, especially with the physical pain. I have mm -hmm. noticed that in moments where the pain that I have experienced was so severe, there was a, an almost a spiritual euphoria that I had attained. And I don't understand if that was my soul sort of going, you know, I've got to get out of my physical body. Mm -hmm. um, but there... There, these moments where you are in such, and I think women who who are who deliver children, who who have mm -hmm. who have childbirth, maybe they experience this as well. But there is a, there is some type of, I don't know if I don't know really exactly what it is or how to to classify it. Mm -hmm. But is there a some kind type of exquisite pain? Ex you mean? Exactly, and yeah, and we are connected at that moment too. We are connected to yes. everything, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I have to say that I have never experienced that kind of physical pain. Uh, I, in my case, the pain, I, I, I don't have a positive thing to say about the pain itself other than uh, it, it forced me to, to examine my life and change in ways that have made my life more beautiful. The only thing that I can think of, Christine, from what you're describing that resonates with me is the pain of grief. Mm. Uh, as intense as it is, it is also at one and the same time uh, revealing of the depth of the love that existed and still exists. You know, I often say to people, when the love is real, the, the grief and the pain is real. And and that's the only thing I can think of, is that this pain of, of loss is also, in a way, very revealing about the depths of the love and the relationship. And, and, but, but other than that, I have to say, in my case, uh, being tortured in the way I felt tortured, you know, nerve pain is torture. Yes. Uh, I, I did not feel anything exquisite. Uh, I felt nothing but, you know, uh, torture until I was on the opioids, and then I felt nothing but... but numb and detached and depressed i think i think with in, in my uh personal case it was a it, it might have been a way for me to escape the physical mm -hmm. and to focus you know on 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 something else i don't i don't know i've i've heard of a few people that kind of they go to an altered state when it's that it's when it's that intense 
Um, yes, yeah, yeah. I wish I could have, but I did. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I missed that train when it came through town. <laughs> but but it goes back to it. Still, it goes back to what you say, which is, and I I think that this is something that needs to be repeated: that pain cracks us open. Yes. Yes. That is yes. powerful. That is so yes. very powerful. If when we can really fully embrace that that the that sentence, you know. Yes. And and yes, it's sort of what I was saying earlier when I said pain cracks us open. But in that brokenness a new kind of wholeness emerges. You know? And this is true in relationships, for example, when when you have a painful break in a relationship and you address it, the relationship is is deeper and better. And again, let's not idealize these kinds of things. It can go either way. I've had women whose husbands have uh, had affairs say to me that the result, the resulting conversation uh, created a much deeper, stronger, more beautiful marriage between the two of them. And, And that it led to, in a sense, them being able to have a second marriage within their first marriage. I've had other women say to me, um, are, do I love him? Yes. Are we still together? Yes. But it would have been much better had it never happened. It will never be the same. Right. This, can, this can go either way, and it depends on many factors, not the least of which is the ability to say I was wrong, and not the least of which is the ability to see that a person who, who causes pain is wounded deeply wounded him or herself oh right exactly you you nailed it on on the head with that yeah Um, yeah. also when you experience something like i mean if it was something that's infidelity or um a a pain of the heart in in a romantic Mm -hmm. or in a um in a love setting um very it, it depends again on how you how you take it but I know for myself too it with those kind of those kind of emotional pains I'm I've been able to look back and actually thank that person for playing a role to me now now in the moment that it happens you don't think that at all you're right. like oh my That's god right. you know wh- who who are you well yes. <laughs> why did you break my yes. heart into a billion pieces but yes. then looking back you you really do grow and also it's a moment for me it was a moment to turn that love that i had for someone else you know an outside love to turn it within to turn that love and give that love to myself and i wouldn't yeah. have done it if i if i hadn't experienced that that type of pain yes that's right that's exactly right uh a broken heart is an open heart yeah and then once you put that love into yourself then you turn around and you know and then you're opening yourself up to a different type of energy instead yeah. of being the wounded hurt person walking around with the wounded heart right, right. saying saying That's right. all men you know, all men lie right. or all women are hurt you or whatever you're like yeah. okay i'm going to just focus on myself and put that love to myself you're attracting a different energy yes you know in in the book there's a piece called you matter that's the title of the piece you matter and and you know to make a, a long essay short I, I essentially say, um, you know, your pain has made you unlike any other person in the world. You are unique. You are un- your pain has, has made of you a uniquely, uniquely built person with a uniquely created soul formed through these experiences. You are uniquely gifted to bring healing into the world you matter because your pain has made you unique now live like it live like you matter that is one of the blessings of pain Mm. one of the um i probably one of the the um, most challenging things anyone can do in their life is to be married to another human being and i say this with great um um, with with a heart filled of with someone that I absolutely love and adore, but mm-hmm. I remember someone saying it was very interesting. It was a, a therapist who said, "Listen, everyone's a pain in the ass. 
including you. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, what's right? the wisdom of what's the wisdom in that? The wisdom is before you judge another person. Yes. Ask ask yourself. Yes. Are you so perfect? Exactly. <laughs> are you are you without flaws? You know, I often have people coming in come to me in, in my office and say, Look, so and so did such and such to me and I just can't forgive him. He gossiped about me, right? Or he he ridiculed me or he whatever it is. And you know, listen, in much gentler in a much gentler way over a much longer period of of time, I, I essentially say to them, and look, are you so perfect? Have you never gossiped? Have you never slammed a door in anger? Have you never failed to reach out to a friend who was suffering? None of us are so perfect. How can you ask for to be treated yourself in ways in which you refuse to treat another? We have such How can time. you yeah. seek forgiveness from 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 your friends and family and people who care about you when you when you fail and not be willing to grant that forgiveness to others, assuming they really have changed. Well, and we have such high expectations of our partners, don't we? We have such high expectations of we will forgive our children, we will forgive our friends, we will forgive politicians. But when it comes to the person that you're you're married to or in a relationship with, we're quite sometimes we we we, we want that perfect person. But what you talk about I think about, that's about power. Yeah. I think withholding I think withholding forgiveness is about power. Oh, yeah. Yes. And and that is not good for a marriage, you know. Let's go back to what we discussed, uh, you know, several minutes ago, the power of saying I was wrong. Oh, yes. Right? Uh, if if that doesn't change the barometric pressure in a marriage, nothing will. So, it's it's both parties. It's the willingness to say I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. It's that that's powerful. But then to be unwilling to grant that forgiveness, assuming the person has truly changed, that's that's about self righteousness and ego and power, uh, and that's not love. And that's not love exactly, exactly. And what and one of the things that you talk about that make a uh, marriage thrive and successful is um, the, the main ingredient that I think so many people miss is friendship. Oh, it's so true. I, I've been right? married uh, <laughs> almost 32 years. In December, it'll be 32 years. And my wife and I, Betsy and I, got engaged on our second date. Oh, we were cute. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. We were 24 years old. We were on our second date. And I just looked at her in the middle of it and I said, you know, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I think you're it. Yeah. And she she looked at me and she said, "Well, I feel the same way." And then I said, as only a you know naive twenty four year old could, I said, "Well, are are we engaged?" <laughs> and she and she said, "I guess so." And that was it, you know. And it's you know thirty two years of marriage, uh, and look, here's the truth about marriage. I say this to every couple that I marry. Almost everything comes and goes in a marriage. Jobs will come and go. Apartments, condos, and houses will come and go. Money comes and goes. Sex comes and goes. Our health comes and goes, and we pray comes back to us again. Everything comes and goes in a marriage. And, you know, even our children as surely as they come into our lives. They leave us to begin their own lives. Everything comes and goes. But if one thing remains, then you will have a beautiful marriage. And that one thing is friendship. Mm. And I think that that is the thing that is missing in so many marriages. It it's seems that way, doesn't it? It seems yeah. like people somehow kind of devolve into becoming roommates. And um, well, I think it's it's you know, just on the way that they get together. Um, so a lot of it is based. I mean, just you know, look around. Some 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 people marry because there is a high sexual attraction in the first few months. Right, sex right. is great. Oh my gosh, I want to marry you. Right, chemistry. Then there is the. Um, the allure of someone who is, you know, extremely, uh, extremely beautiful or physically, you know, fit or yeah, financial yeah. security, Money. financial, exactly, security. Yeah. So they're marrying, they're marrying each other for reasons that are self-preservation, perhaps. Yes. Um, and not for the real, true 
meaning of, of, of living with someone for the, for the rest of your life and caring for them, which is friendship. Yes. Because yes, you have to really, friendship. really like, it's not just about saying this person is, you know, a great, looks great on paper, but this person is my best friend and I trust this person with my life. That's right. That's right. It's exactly right. And, you know, um, the rest comes and goes. Exactly. Mostly goes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> our waistlines. <laughs> Look, it changes. The world changes. Our bodies change. It, it all changes. But if your friendship remains, you're going to be you're going to be better than okay, come and, what may. And especially since we experience pain with our partner at that point. Yes. We're not alone. You know, We're with a partner. The, yeah, yeah you're, you're raising another really, I think, important point about pain. There is nothing more intimate, nothing, than caring, caring for another person when he or she is vulnerable and in pain. Pain is, a, is an intimate invitation into another person's heart and soul. Uh, when when I had uh, went through my surgery and everything that followed, I I, I don't know what I would have done without without my wife Betsy. I, I just don't know. She she carried me to the bathroom. She when when I there was nothing I wanted to eat and I was losing so much weight. She she made these most incredible but delicious grilled cheese sandwiches for me. It was the only thing I wanted to eat for months. It was comfort food in the real meaning of the word, you know. And then a year and a half after my surgery, Betsy had uh, abdominal surgery. She suffers from uh, Crohn's disease, which is a really vicious disease. And uh, she had a bowel resection, and she came home with drains, two drains hanging out of her abdominal cavity. And, and it was my job every morning to empty her drains and measure the liquid. And, and you know, for all that we'd been through together, I, I never felt more intimate, more, more connected to her than emptying her drains. And, and that's, that's love. Yes. Yes. Wow. You just uh you just moved me so much. Uh, <laughs> folks, if you've just tuned in, the uh my guest this hour is Rabbi Steve Leader and we are talking about his latest book, which I hope that you run out and get. It's called More Beautiful Than Before: How Suffering Transforms Us. And Rabbi, um, I wanted to know if um, if there's a website. Do you have a website where people can find out more? You know, you? so I'm kind of an old dude. I'm 57. <laughs> <and> my... <laughs> old dude, wait a second. You're just a few years older than me. <laughs> well, okay, welcome to the club. So we're, you know, my social media presence is 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 really pathetic, but I am working on it. I've actually hired someone to create a website and. You know, all the things that I guess are required these days if you want to communicate with people. <laughs> you don't um, need to twit, you know, I, tweet. I'm back in the age of carrier pigeons, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm working on it. Uh, there will be a website. It, you can get to it either uh, through steveleader.com or rabbistevleader.com or morebeautifulthanbefore.com. But it's not up yet. It will be soon. Uh, and listen, I, I'm going to ask for help from your listeners uh, and your fans that if you're moved by this conversation and you're moved by the book, please, please tell others. Use your social media platforms uh, to get the word out. It seems to be the way that information is passed uh, from one person to another these days. So I, I hope others will help me in this. I, I'm going to get with the program very shortly, but in the meantime, I, I need help, and I appreciate your help today. Oh, it's it's my pleasure. Like I said, the the creation of out of the box radio was for this very purpose to to help people transform their lives, um, and help and and so that they can also help others who are going through uh, similar situations. And we all are, and, and especially when it relates to to pain and suffering. This yes. actually, this particular this interview is going to be is will be on YouTube, so people can share it very easily in emails. Or post great. it on their on their Facebook pages and things like That's that. That's great, and I find that works the best because once we do a live show, uh, it airs that once, and if you're not just tuned in at that moment, you can miss some very important information, and then this way it can be easily shared. Um, with from my guests and also with the listeners. So that's that's what that that's great. It'll be available. Um, absolutely great. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about when when we ourselves are not in pain, 
but when someone else is mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how so we can important. how yes. we can deal with that and how we can help because you had touched on that earlier in the conversation too which i thought was brilliant about also understanding or uh, wondering about when someone who causes pain what what brought them to that right. point, right? right. But, but right. what can we do to help someone right. that is in pain? Okay, let's start with what you should never do. Right? Okay, that, well, that's with, good, let's, yeah. Let's start with the don'ts, okay? The first thing is never say the following seven words. Let me know if you need anything. That is the, uh, that is the wrong thing to say to someone who's suffering. First of all, it puts the burden on the sufferer which is unfair. That person is already burdened enough. It's your job to anticipate, to think for yourself about what might help that person, and then just do it. Don't ask. Just do it. It also often is a kind of fake or false empathy. A lot of people who say, let me know if you need anything, are also at the same time thinking, and I sure hope you don't. And I sure hope you don't. <laughs> I hope you don't call because <laughs> right. I, 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 I like you, but I'm pretty busy and I was just saying that I didn't really mean it. Right. And people know this. The whole thing is kind of like kabuki theater at that point. So never say, let me know if you need anything. Figure something out that you can do to help, whatever that is, whether that's sending a meal to the house, whether that's volunteering to drive carpool or set up play dates or send a massage therapist to the house or a card or an email or you know a text every few days i'm thinking about you think of something you can do and just do it the other thing i would say is never say glib things like well you know god only gives you as much as you can handle oh, that, don't it's do a that. horrible thing to say first of all how, who are you to know how god works right and secondly uh you know who who is god even to know how much a person can handle it, it's a terrible thing to say uh, put it in the positive, you know, I know with my help and the help of other people who love you and your own internal resources and strengths because of the other things you've been through, I know that you're going to get through this and I'm here to help. Now, let's talk about what does that mean, I'm here to help. Often, people call me with uh, a question about what to say to someone who's suffering. You know, uh, Steve, my best friend from college was just diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He's been given three to six months. I'm going back east to see him. What do I say? And my answer is always, don't worry about it. Just walk in the door. Just walk in the door. Just show up. The rest will unfold as it should. Because in many of these cases, there is nothing to say. Just show up. And and it'll, it will be fine. And by the way, show up as yourself. You don't have to walk in with this kind of false, you know, dramatic, sad face on. You know, be who you are with the person. That's what he or she wants and needs. If you're a joker, joke. If you're a feeder, feed. If you're a talker, talk. If you're a listener, listen. Be who you have always been for that person. That's what we need when we're suffering. We need people to just show up because the worst thing about pain is the feeling of isolation and abandonment that's what hurts feeling like you are alone in it so just show up don't say anything glib you don't have to have answers you know the navajo have a beautiful custom when someone in the village dies you go to the home of the mourners you walk in you sit down you say nothing you stay for a while, and then you leave. Mm -hmm. Your mere physical presence says everything that needs to be said. I, I often tell people that showing up in that way changes nothing, but means everything. Mm. And you're, and then that way too, you're allowing them to. To if they want to be quiet, if they want to be left alone, that's right. Then that's fine. That's right. But then they can also you, reach out. To your you. job is to you know to be to be, be who there. you are. Yeah. Just be, because just the very act of showing up pierces that sense of isolation and loneliness. Mm. Don't we all remember who showed up for us when we were suffering? Don't you remember when you broke your neck? Who yes. who sent a card? 
who reached out, you know, uh, who sent flowers, who sent food, who stepped up to help. You remember everyone who helped. You do. It matters. Just show up. Don't ask. Just do. Rabbi Stephen Leader, you're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. These conversations are, you know, so so important. They are, and um, and I and I know that uh, that you're going to have a lot of people. And I'm so glad that you took this out of the just the, out of the congregation in Los Angeles, which I'm, I know it's a very large one, and and a lot of people at the temple get to hear you. But my goodness, now. People from all different backgrounds all around the world are going to be able to yeah. get the wisdom from, from That's you. That's the hope. That's yeah. the hope. You know, is, uh, you can only personally do so much, but a book can really extend that reach in a way that, that helps more people, and that's the mission. Well, I love your mission. I love your mission. Ah, thank you. Um, again, folks, the, the book is called More Beautiful Than Before, How Suffering Transforms Us. Uh, it's written by my guest, Rabbi Steve Leader, and please do rush out and get a copy of this, and especially if it's not for yourself, then maybe for someone uh, who you love, who has been suffering or is suffering, physical or emotional or spiritual um, pain and suffering. Again, Rabbi Steve Leader, thank you so very much for coming on Out of the Box Radio today. Thank you. It was my honor to be here. And also, you can subscribe to this podcast so you don't ever miss an episode. It's at, available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Podbean, everywhere else that you can imagine. It's available. And if you subscribe to it, then you'll never miss an episode. So please do that. And until next time, I want to always remind you to think outside of the box. Bye for now.